Virgin Mars. Я почитаю название доклада по-русски. Разрушение советского как способ присвоения памяти о нем. Изучение реконструкции советской исключительности и многословности культурной памяти в современной российской тележурналистике. Университет Гронинген на Нидерланды. the post-Soviet period and I work especially on 2000 uh, until present and I wanted to start with uh, an exhibition that you can visit in this town right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, an exhibition uh, of uh, a collection of photographs of the official visit of the royal family to Kostroma in 1913. Uh, this was a visit to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the, <laughs> of the, the Romanov uh, a dynasty. And uh, what struck me when I saw uh, this exhibition is uh, the fact that it's being organized in 2013 and there are actual national celebrations of the 400th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty. But still, in this text, it's not even mentioned. So what they are doing is just indicating this memory event in 1913, but not mentioning the 400th anniversary right now. So what I was wondering is, why is there no mention? Uh, and what I want to suggest, and what is also the, the topic of my paper, is that actually uh, this, the reworking of the Soviet past in the present period creates a certain tension um, with such attempts to reconnect present-day Russia to pre-revolutionary pre Russia. And uh, I think that might be connected to why it's not mentioned. Uh, so for my paper, I took as uh, the point of departure uh, the, the observation that the Putin regime has used historical myths and historical events in a way that is very different from the Yeltsin government in the 1990s. So whereas the Yeltsin regime tried to create a certain distance towards both Soviet and post-Soviet uh, pre uh, uh, Soviet periods, uh, Putin has based his political legitimacy on uh, a narrative of historical continuity. Uh, so in the paper I analyzed his tendency to actually refrain from conceptualizing the Soviet as a unique civilization, uh, a tendency which I think can be seen as a characteristic of uh, state-supported politics of memory in this uh, present uh, Putin era. So instead of endorsing the idea of Soviet exceptionalism, um, which would require political actors to actually uh, take position towards this period, uh, this myth of Soviet uniqueness is being dismantled. And the Soviet period is integrated into this media narrative of Russian history that is characterized by alternating uh, periods of uh, turbulent upheaval and then glorious might. So we have the, the smoothie and then uh, restoration of order. Uh, and in this media narrative, the, the the Soviet period is just one variation on this historical theme, just another chain in Russia's cyclical history. And my paper argues that the deconstruction of the Soviet exceptionalism uh, actually allows for reappropriating the memory of the Soviet past. So it's no longer seen as a unique phenomenon, but rather it's neutralized. It's a natural occurrence in the development of Russian history. Um, and furthermore, what I wanted to do in my paper is to draw attention to the, the layering of cultural memory uh, that appears to be inherently connected to the cyclical uh, conception of Russian history. So the idea of recurring smoothing and subsequent uh, restoration of order is not only cyclical as a historical model, but also as a memory discourse. So uh, to give an example, uh, the way that the memory of the original Smuta was used uh, to portray the victory of Napoleon in, in 1812. 
So you have the statue of Mini in Pizhovsky on the Red Square. And then the use of the memory of the Smuta to again mobilize the population against the German army in the Stalinist period. Uh, and as a consequence, the memory uh, becomes similar to a palimpsest that is repeatedly written on, uh, but continues to carry the traces of the writings it previously carried. And the claim that the 1990s should be seen as the latest occurrence of such a small bit, uh, uh, historical interpretation that was also propagated by the Putin regime through references in political statements and, of course, uh, the Day of National Unity that was uh, established in 2005, that necessarily invokes these earlier uses of the same smuta idea. And the decision to reactivate the idea of the time of troubles is, uh, to describe these most recent upheavals in Russia, therefore not acti activates not only the memory itself, but I want to argue that it activates a memory chain. So all these different remediations that are gathered together. So the multiple layers of this memory can remain implicit, um, but often they actually rise to the surface, and especially in television documentaries, which is what I work on most, uh, the practice of layering is quite extensive. And these documentaries that indicate links and parallels between different periods in history, and both in the narrative content and in the uh, historical and fiction film footage that they actually employ. Um, so uh, what I used as an example in my paper is a documentary called Smutne Evremia from 2006. Uh, and I want, what I want to argue is that one important effect of actually invoking this idea of smuta and its own memory chain uh, is that this idea of the Soviet past as a dangerous field of memory uh, is being neutralized. And it can be sort of reconnected to uh, a comprehensive account of Russian history. Uh, so, for the remainder of my paper, I will discuss this example uh, and uh, discuss how this uh, historical analogy of the Putin era as a post smuta era is being constructed in this documentary. So, as one would expect on the basis of the title, it, it of course uh, discusses the lead up and the unfolding and the ending of the time of troubles, but the narrative takes several detours at important points. And this suggests to me that the, the history of the time of troubles it's but a means to discuss bigger topics of Russian politics and the relation between state and society. So in the opening sequence of this documentary, uh, first subtly, subtly this topic is introduced in image and subsequent editing, and then explicitly in voiceover, this idea of historical parallels and recurring smoothing. And it is stated that for Russia, imposture, samozonstva, has become a chronic disease that characterizes the country's historical development in a way it copes with the transition of power. And uh, the narrator, Mikhail Leontiev, addresses the viewer directly to sum up the central argument. And he says, and I quote, the history of time of troubles is a history of betrayal of the country by its political elite, end of quote. And that there have been several times of troubles in Russian history, namely 1605, 1917, and 1991. And the explicit mentioning of these periods in Russian history that are deemed to be comparable and to a certain extent dictated by these rules governing Russia's historical development then leads the way for a large number of alleged historical parallels. The death of uh, Ivan Grozny is compared to the death of Stalin. Uh, Boris Godunov is mirrored by Khrushchev. Mm -hmm. uh, Semen Bayarshina is equated with the 1990s Semen Bankirshina. And according to the same logic that the Russian state repeatedly slips into political chaos, it also succeeds in eventually overcoming uh, these periods of near state collapse. And two factors that are, uh, according to this documentary, decisive for the restoration of political order are firstly, the will of the Russian people that unites, and secondly, the role of the Orthodox Church. And it's also here that, again, parallels are drawn between 1612 and the transition from the 1990s to the Putin era. So the role, of, the leading role of the Orthodox Church is being emphasized. And in, in the concluding passages of the documentary, the, the Soviet parallel that was pointed out throughout the documentary remains absent. And uh, indeed, it's also less self-evident here. So if you indeed take the Russian Revolution as a time of troubles, then when did it end? and which period of the early history of the Soviet Union should be considered as a period of restoration, and consequently, as in some ways, analogous to the present. 
and the layering of memories, the reconnecting of different periods, uh, and indeed the implication or even construction of this particular memory chain that I'm discussing uh, is actually not without precedence. So you, you only need to recall the 1939 film Mimi uh, that, uh, of course, uh, discusses the historical events of the Smuta, uh, but at the beginning of the film, uh, reference is made to the earlier period in Russian history when the 1612 victory was commemorated by showing the, the actual statue of Mimi Pozharsky that was uh, erected in commemoration of the victory over Napoleon. So one could say that the, the present remediation, reappropriation of this memory chain in this 2006 documentary uh, posits a continuation of the same argumentation and thereby strengthens the connection to the Stalinist era, uh, but also adding to the consolidation and the mythification of this cultural memory itself. Uh, and I want to argue that this is not merely a neutral or a homogenizing process, uh, as will also become clear from the following. Uh, the implicit and also explicit references to earlier mediations of the same historical narrative can also complicate its meaning and invest it with historical and even moral implications. So historically layered memory texts like this one uh, never give rise to the question whether original texts leave a trace on the memory and sort of refract its meaning. Uh, so what I want to do is show you one clip to make uh, clear what I'm talking about. And it's a, a passage about Ligitimna uh, Lust, and I hope we have some. So I hope this makes a bit more clear what I mean with connecting different periods, creating analogies, uh, and even only by showing images, because the narration doesn't even mention the appearance of Stalin. Uh, so why is this done? What is the effect? Uh, and what is most inter interesting to me is that it's not uh, narrated. So uh, the viewer, if you would be in your kitchen and you're not watching but listening, you wouldn't even know that this his, uh, historical analogy between Ivan Grozny and Stalin is being made. Uh, so, um, this is created solely through the editing of the sequence. So, uh, the fact that it's made suddenly, uh, so in image, uh, gives rise to the, me uh, to the question how this affects the meaning of the sequence and also uh, what it tells us about the way that the Stalinist past is being dealt with and the inexplicable connections between Stalin and what his advocates present as his achievements on the one hand and the undeniable cruel repressions connected to his regime on the other hand complicate and sensitize memory texts that deal with his legacy. So the successive editing places Stalin in the context of returning cycles of state violence and repression to the effect that a certain emotional distance is being created. 
And the fact that the parallel is implicit in this, uh, that's implicit in the sequence is made in image only is very significant, and moreover draws attention to the paradoxical uh, position that the Soviet history occupies in many cultural and political uses of the notion of smuta since 2000. So if we seek to outline a, sort of a general model of how the 17th century historical events are placed in historical parallels, uh, two different strategies emerge. Uh, so, uh, on the one hand, uh, the smuta itself, as a, a period of chaos and near-state collapse, is being connected to the Russian Revolution and the disintegration of the Soviet Union, and sometimes you also see references to 1937. So, evidently, the Soviet period is a very important component of this negative or even traumatic side of the Time of Troubles memory. But on the other hand, the end of the Time of Troubles, so the victory narrative, is being connected to the victory over Napoleon, and the political rule of Putin in the new millennium. And so Soviet history is conspicuously absent from the victorious side of the Time of Troubles myth. And the fact that the constructed chain of victories circumvents the Second World War uh, appears to be incongruous with the prominent place 1945 holds in contemporary politics of memory is one of the primary factors of national pride. And a possible explanation of the omission of 1945 to me uh, lies in the emphasis that is being placed on the role of the Orthodox Church in uniting uh, the Russian uh, people. Uh, so I have one quote by, by Patriarch Kirill, and I don't have time to discuss it extensively, I'm afraid. Uh, but here you see that he's actually combining these two, and he's making a comparison between the 1990s and these different periods in history that are uh, equally traumatic. So he's comparing uh, the 1990s with the Smuta and then uh, Napoleon, uh, Hitler, and the Civil War. But what's interesting is not necessarily this quote, but, but what the news coverage did with this quote. So what they ended up doing was sort of re-editing this quote back to the victory format. And then it only held a comparison between uh, overcoming the 1990s and 1812 and 2012. So it's then added back to this format. So um, I think this is a very interesting uh, development, uh, um, and I'm uh, very excited to just continue working on this and uh, finding more examples and sort of creating more of a theoretical uh, concept of how this works and how it's being dealt with. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see Uh, and I have a question. Uh, how did the historiography, how did the works of the uh, Russian and American historians re 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 reflect and uh, impact and shape this documentary? Because there is a very, very interesting uh, research done by Professor Ruslan Skrinikov and other uh, historians on this subject. And I'm curious whether the people who were making these movies, they were somehow aware or maybe they integrated this uh, research. <coughs> And another quick question, uh, where exactly was it shown? Because it, if it was shown on the first channel, Первый uh, канал, it's one story, if it's shown on the different canal, because uh, we all know that they are controlled by different um, groups. And I'm going to say it in Russia. Очень интересный доклад, у меня был вопрос, насколько историография, насколько работы наших российских и американских историков, они были отражены в этом документальном фильме. В частности, есть интересное очень исследование профессора Руслана Скрынникова. Мне вот интересно, насколько, насколько так сказать, создатели этого фильма они обратились к историкам. А второй вопрос. Мне было интересно, где именно был показан этот фильм, на Первом канале или на каких-то других каналах. I haven't yet researched the, the actual cooperation, uh, sort of the, the institutional background and production history of this documentary. So I've been focusing more on uh, its actual content and the images that are being used. Um, but I know that there uh, have been some quite extensive works done by Russian historians on this idea of smuta and how it's being reworked, and especially uh, in, uh, in connection with the Russian Revolution, and then also how it's still relevant for the present. Uh, uh, many Zborniki uh, have written about this, so um, that is still uh, for me to, to do and actually engage in, but I think that would be a very interesting point of departure to sort of 
delve deeper into this. Uh, and um, it was actually shown on the Pietri Canal and also uh, paid for, and so it's a, uh, just a Russian state television production. It's great. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. My question is about the selection of your material. Actually, I wonder whether you are particularly interested in the state-sponsored pro uh, project of memory mm -hmm. or you are interested in a wider range of projects. So what actually is at stake? Because it's clear that Mikhail Leontief mm -hmm. is a specific journalist. Mm -hmm. So and the, then the range is much wider. Okay, um, um, I'm a PhD student and just the, the general scope of my research is uh, sort of seeing television, especially these state-owned uh, channels, uh, as a space of interaction between different actors, sort of the state trying to influence but not complete control, cultural elite and the interaction between all these different actors. So for me, uh, nationwide TV channels are most interesting to uh, do my research, so that's uh, the first uh, criterion for my selection. Um, so for me, it's mostly state-sponsored, but of course it, for me it's also very interesting to see uh, different uh, documentaries and try to see sort of uh, uh, anti-narratives being introduced as well. So you have the, the state-sponsored line, and then you have critical actors trying to sort of uh, undermine these narratives. So for instance, if you have the idea of the smuta, uh, then you have uh, Vladimir Mirzoyev's film Buddy Skogunov, which is basically sort of an anti-narrative of the same idea. So that's what, what I'm working on. Uh, I ask you Russian. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that the film Берзоева построен на аналогичном нарративе. Мне кажется, что он, наоборот, подрывает вот те нарративы смуты, которые сложились за 2000 е годы. Но я хотел сказать о другом. Мне кажется, важным для обсуждаемой вами темы затронут два пункта. Первый из них заключается в том, что до того, как стать достоянием государственных медиа, этот дискурс репрезентации смуты, 90-х годов как смуты, был выработан среди русских националистов. Достаточно сказать, что памятник Минину и Пожарскому, упомянутый в вашем докладе, был, стал логотипом одного из крайне националистических русских журналов в нашей современной в 90-е годы. Вот. И второе, это важно. Второе, и, собственно, при этом русские националисты, они наследовали э, самой э, политики отсылки к прошлому, сложившейся в сталинское время, сравнение э, скрытого Сталина с Иваном Грозным и Петром Первым. Просто акценты были перенесены на другой исторический период. Вот. Второе, э, не менее важное, да, и тут важно, конечно, что Леонтьев является крайним националистом, здесь я присоединяюсь э, к э, реплике э, к одному из предшествующих вопросов. Второе, э, что я хотел добавить, э, что... Чрезвычайно, я не знаю, есть ли это в вашей презентации, я не успел ее прочитать, что чрезвычайно важным пунктом, когда вот была эксплицирована та риторика, о которой вы говорите, была пропагандистская риторика российских властей, связанная с утверждением 4 ноября, как дня всенародного единения и согласия. И в связи с этим, конечно, вспоминается не только тот сериал, о котором вы говорите, но и фильм Владимира Хатиленко 1612. Вы знаете об этом фильме? Фильм Владимир Хатиненко, Владимир Хатиненко с фильм «Сикстин и Твелф». Я хочу Uh, Russian uh, cultural elite or a representative of Russian uh, sort of uh, uh, generally hold opinions. Uh, so it, it, you should see it as Leontiev and what he stands for and his position and political engagement. And of course, uh, as you said, it's very much connected to nationalist tendencies. Uh, so uh, the, the it's it's a very colored. Uh, way of viewing history. Yes. That's that's for sure. Uh, and uh, I think that this uh, documentary is from 2006, 
uh, and I think you should see it as uh, one of these productions that was actually aimed at popularizing the Day of National Unity. Mm -hmm. So indeed, you have a, a couple of documentaries from 2005, and then you have the Khatinenka, and then you have this one. It's not a documentary. No, no, it, it's a film, yeah, I know, yeah. But I think you should see it, it's, a, it's sort of a combined effort to make uh, this idea of the smuta more known among the public, to make it popular. So of course, if you sort of, uh, this is a documentary, uh, which is somehow a little bit intellectual, but you have uh, Khatinenko's film, which is much more popular, aimed at youth, so uh, yeah, they are aimed at different audiences. But the central aim is to make clear mm -hmm. that we are now in a post-Smuta era. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, exactly what I'm aiming at, uh, sort of as the end point of what I'm doing, is to see how uh, these different actors interact in creating these historical narratives and with what aim, why are they presenting it in this way? Uh, but of course, uh, to connect to the theme of this conference, I wanted to show this one because it has this uh, fascinating uh, insertion of all these Soviet elements as well, uh, which creates yet another layer to this whole discussion. So it's not just about the 1990s as a smutta, but it's actually about Stalin as well. So it becomes very complex and very integrated. Thank you. Да, спасибо большое. И у меня больше нет времени. И сейчас время для.